An hour ago, this 17-year-old was shot on the streets of Detroit. Now, suddenly, he's a victim and a patient here in our emergency room. He's alone and confused and afraid in an alien world of bright lights and unfamiliar sights and sounds. We'll ease his physical pain and treat his physical wounds. But what about his emotional pain and his emotional wounds? They can be just as devastating. Shouldn't that be our concern as well? I mean, I hear about people getting shot out. Oh, he got shot off, you know. Just blow it, going one end out the other. But when it happened to me, I went into a state of shock. I'm saying, I mean, my, my whole, I'm saying, my, you know, my whole idea, my mind, like, I'm finna die. I'm laying on the street. I'm about to die. That's all I kept thinking about. And you know what I mean? It's a scary feeling. Doctors coming in there asking you. I mean, telling you, Mr. Shanklin, we don't know if we can save your leg. Mr. Shanklin, we don't know if you're gonna die. I mean, that, 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 that affects you mentally. It really does. Post-traumatic stress disorder is the syndrome of really a normal response to abnormal events. And the abnormal events have to have that quality of being searing and intrusive and horrifying and terrifying. Uh, any of us can have PTSD, more or less. But for some people, it lasts a long time, and it has other elements as well. It, it embarrasses them. It makes them feel ashamed and weak and guilty. It drives them to drink. Uh, it causes panic and depression. But what we're looking at here is a response that many people have to abnormally intense traumatic events. Flashbacks are, I mean, a lot of decrease in sleep. I mean, certain, certain areas of the city, certain areas of the city are, they remind me of what happened. You know, I, I wake up in cold sweats and think, you know, just re they re repeating over and over in my mind, like, nah, I'm still fresh in my mind now. You know, I, I get scared at first. When I first got home, my mother might have to go to work. I didn't want to stay there by myself, because I was scared. I'm thinking, well, this guy coming to finish me off. You understand what I'm saying? PTSD is three things at once, and the first, the real guts of it is that you're haunted by your memory. It comes back to you. It can horrify you and terrify you. It can be a flashback. It can be a nightmare. And you don't want to remember. And this part of the triad often causes people to think they're going crazy because they're not controlling their mind. The second part is almost the opposite. It's not having feelings in general, being numb or deliberately or unconsciously avoiding those parts of your life that might trigger a reminder. And the third part is physiological. The third part is having your threshold for anxiety and fear and arousal being lowered so any little thing can make you jumpy and it disturbs your sleep and your thinking and your sex life. Those three parts together are PTSD. Bohannon, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good tonight. Pretty good? Mm -hmm. Dr. Eaton is a psychologist specializing in post-traumatic therapy. Dennis Bohannon is one of her patients. 18 months ago, he was the victim of a brutal drive-by shooting outside his local grocery store. He's been back for over 30 operations. When you went home, that's when you first noticed uh, PTSD symptoms, is that right? Yes. What did you notice? What, what well, did you I started see? having nightmares. Okay. You know, How yeah. often were you having them? Every night. night. Every night. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't get a full night's sleep mm -hmm. any night? No. And what kind of, what would be the, the uh, subject of the nightmares? What would you dream? 
a dream, just what happened, you well, know. The, the, yeah, what happened? Reliving it reliving. again and again, every time you would go to sleep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go through each of the elements of the post-traumatic stress disorder. First, there is the intrusive recollection. It means that out of the blue, without any clear warning, you're there again. And it can have the intensity and the immediacy of a flashback. That means it is as vivid as it was when you first encountered it. You may actually hallucinate a smell, a touch, a sight. Very intense and very disturbing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a flashback, though. It can just simply be a memory, and you would rather not remember. When you were home, before you came back in for this surgery, were you going out of the house at all? Not very much not at all. Not very much? Mm -mm. Yeah. Just on the front porch to get the mail, and, and if I had to, you know, go out to the car and then back in the house. Okay. That was it. And this is over a year and a half? Yes. Now, the second part is... Uh, six or seven individual possibilities, but all together they're called the negative symptoms. Not having feeling, feeling somewhat alienated from others, finding that uh, just almost automatically you stop doing the things that you used to do that was, were a source of pleasure because you don't want to risk a reminder. Any loud sound. Yeah. You know, like, Maybe that would sound like a gunshot? Yeah. Okay. My son be playing with his guns and some, you know, he'd oh dear. shoot one yeah. of them. And oh dear. It'd yeah. make me nervous. He'd know. be playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The third part, the increased arousal, the anxiety cluster, means that your adrenal gland is triggered that much more readily, uh, that you are very, very aware of threats and that you're jumpy, you're nervous. Coming back in? Yes. Coming back? Yeah. Some of the patients who come into Detroit Receiving uh, are coming in in life and death situations. They've been shot, they've been stabbed, they've been raped, they've been scalded. And of course this is a trauma for the individual and for everyone who cares about them and loves them. And the nurse, the doctor, uh, the person who deals with this physical wound is in a unique situation to help that whole family and that individual understand emotional reactions. In the beginning, what they say may not be totally absorbed, but they can say a little bit about what might occur down the road as part of the healing process. And by doing this, they remove the fear and they remove the confusion and they remove the stigma. It can be pretty frightening being wheeled in here, suddenly finding yourself in this alien world. We all know that. So what can we do to help? Just to reach out and connect, something we do instinctively can be very important, maybe more than we sometimes realize. William, I'm Dr. Eaton, and I'm a trauma therapist here in the emergency department. You were brought in tonight, and you were, had been shot, is that right? Yes. Yeah. You know you're OK now, right? Yeah. What, do you mind telling me what happened? Dr. Eaton's job is to find those trauma cases most at risk and intervene as early as possible. William was just shot in the leg, so he's definitely a candidate. He may or may not get PTSD, but if he does, knowing the symptoms and the risks and that help is available can make all the difference. Now, you know, when you get home, you'll probably feel very relieved for a while, but then sometimes uh, people who've been through an experience like you have, uh, some months later, maybe three or four months later, may have flashbacks or <laughs> nightmares or ha not want to go out of the house and things like that. That's called post-traumatic stress disorder. And about one in uh, four or five people develop it. Okay, so if you do, uh, I want you to give me a call and I'll give you something with my um, name and phone number on it so you can call me, okay? okay. There is a phrase, the second wound. It's the wound that often comes when 
we who work with people are insensitive. I'm Dr. Sullivan. What's bothering you today, sir? Pushing and pushing for detail when an individual is confused, is numb, uh, can't bring forth that detail, or when those details are so highly charged that it's emotionally damaging. We never mean to push too hard, but all of us do it at times, especially when it's really busy. Getting involved with patients and their families means sharing their hopes and fears and sometimes their grief. Emotions that can be hard to handle. So we tend to put up walls. We call it coping. It's only natural. Yeah, Christopher bothered me a lot. He was in a diving accident, and uh, he was a quad, too. And it was, uh, he had a little brother, and he was only 13. I guess he had, you know, really been a, a good kid, a kind of kid with a paper route and done everything right, and uh, somebody just came up to the car and, and uh, shot him in the head, some other kid. We came in that, that morning, and, and uh, he was just as pale as a ghost, and they said it's just a matter of time. You know, he wasn't going to make it, and um, to hear his sister screaming, and, you know, um, the mother just kind of sitting there in a daze. How unfair for a 13-year-old boy to die. Uh, there's nothing that can be said. All you can do is just be there with them through it. Sometimes after, uh, that's when uh, I find myself uh, crying on the way home. We all have stories like these, stories that have affected us, stories that we carry with us. It helps to share these emotions, to work them out, especially with our coworkers, People who'll understand, who've been through it too. Dealing with our feelings, confronting them. It helps us to get on with our work, helps us move on to that next patient and their loved ones. Dr. Sweeney, our Vice Chief of Emergency Medicine, has learned to deal with it. He's learned how to survive. He also knows he's vulnerable, even down here in the emergency department where there's less time to get involved. Even here, a patient or their family can get to us, sometimes when we least expect it. I had an individual one time who was a young uh, male who had been involved in a, in a drug deal that went badly, and the individual was shot and then brought in, and this was a real trauma code where there are bells and whistles and, you know, IVs being slammed in and, and lots of hoopla in this room to the screaming, yelling and everything. And we were unsuccessful. You know, the magic didn't work. And we were given the history that this individual had been involved in this drug deal, so the, the, the sort of defense mechanism went up and the wall went up and, oh, you know, we lost an individual, but maybe it's not so bad because he was a drug dealer and things were bad. Um, and we left the room, and the room was all this big bloody mess and everything. And we walked out, and I was told by the, the um, lead nurse um, that there was the, a relative out there and that it was his father. So I went out there, and here was this little man sitting in the, the, in the, the corner of the room, which, which we call the bad news room, and he was a very well-dressed little man, a Hispanic gentleman. And I sat down in a very, you know, uh, robotic way, and I said, you know, Mr. So-and-so, and, um, was this your son? And we talked briefly for a little bit, and then I said, uh, I have some bad news, and I said, your son is dead. And it was like a shot went through him. And at the same time, it went through me. And it was just like somebody had taken me and completely thrown me out of the, through the wall. 
because I connected with him in a way that just took his soul and being and, and more or less destroyed it. And he, in turn, connected with me somehow, and I was devastated. I was trashed. No matter how deeply we're affected, it's always harder on the family. At least we're prepared. We've done it before, and we're on our home ground. They aren't. The shock of what's happened to a loved one can be overwhelming. The sudden realization of the enormity, the finality of what's happened. And this too can cause PTSD. Sometimes a, a parent will just sit in a daze, or a wife will just sit sort of dissociated. She's out in her own, you know, out in uh, Never Never Land or whatever you want to call it, uh, just sort of there with her husband who's been shot and may or may not survive, but not really there. The victim's family is at risk as well. Uh, someone has been suddenly ripped out of their role. It could be a child and the parent could feel terribly guilty that they didn't protect this child. It could be a wage earner and everyone in the family can wonder about their, uh, their financial security. Uh, it could be the mother, uh, the wife, and, and uh, just think about the impact of that. Yes, every seriously, suddenly wounded individual disrupts not just your plans, but disrupts your whole sense of, of security and meaning in life. Now, when you come to a place like this that has its own rituals and its own sense of security and its basis in science and in medicine, it helps to undo that, that feeling of strangeness, uh, that feeling of, of having been just chewed up and spit out by your own community. My head might be all over my head, but this like with Ryan, you know, he he didn't want to talk about it. And his family family got mad with me because I told him you are a quadriplegic. And he said, No, I don't want to talk about it. Don't call me that. Don't call you know, you'd have thought I really called him a bad name, you know. <laughs> don't call me that. And he told his mother, I called him a quadriplegic. And she said, Ryan told me you called him a quadriplegic. Nobody's ever called him that before. I said, That is what he is, and you and you and you, all of you need to deal with it and and say it to him. A lot of them don't like to talk about it. A lot of the patients, they don't like to elaborate on their injuries. I think they're still in, when they're here, they're still in a denial to a sense. Mm -hmm. Denial is a, is a term in psychiatry. And it means that you don't consciously absorb the full impact of what has occurred. Now, sometimes denial is a very, very helpful, life-saving part of recovery. It's been discovered that people who had very, very severe body burns and who denied how close they were to death, how badly they were disfigured, how painful their recovery would be, lived longer than those who didn't deny this. But ultimately, there comes a time of reckoning. You've lost your apartment. You're, you've lost a lot of your ability to live independently. And I'm here to help you, okay? We're here to help you talk about it, think about it. If going through a severe physical and psychological trauma, one of our patients is in denial, we have to be sensitive to that. And it takes the art part of the science and art of healing to time the discussions and to help a person eventually come into full awareness. You thought you were going to be here longer. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to be straight with our patients, even when it means upsetting them. The sooner they come to terms with what's happened, the sooner they'll be able to get on with the rest of their lives. It's important for a doctor or a nurse to know something about this field and to be able with confidence to say to a patient, you may have PTSD, and if you do, there are specialists who are gonna help you with it. And then the doctor or nurse who was there at the time, who is not a psychiatrist and not a psychologist and doesn't carry some of the baggage that we in the mental health field do, because we still are seen by many people who haven't had contact with us as those folks who treat crazy people. But the doctor or the nurse can say, if you have some of these symptoms, you're not crazy, and it's not progressive, and there are experts who are gonna help see you through it, and I'm gonna be interested in knowing how you do as well. 
Look at me, what's wrong? Nothing, you're okay? Just that little bit of understanding, encouragement, intervention can make all the difference. I know you didn't do anything wrong. Understanding that a victim of a severe trauma may be as badly wounded emotionally as physically. Knowing that if untreated, those emotional wounds can develop into chronic PTSD, a severe, debilitating psychiatric condition. Knowing we can reduce that risk if we spot the signs while they're still in our care and refer them to a specialist. Reassuring them that the emotional aftershocks they may be feeling or may feel later are normal reactions to abnormal events. So you're not having so many? Remember, too, that what's true for our patients is equally true for us. Ours is emotionally charged work, something we all have to learn to deal with. We can't be afraid to connect with our patients. It'll make us better caregivers. It'll make us better people, too. And it needn't burn us out as long as we keep it all in perspective. As long as we talk about it. as long as we're there for each other.